this is a really great meeting. It, in fact, it's so great that I changed my speech four times while I, I was listening. And I concluded that I could do no better than begin by putting in a good word for hate. You know, when I get up in the morning and I turn on Radio 4 and listen to the Today program, I almost viscerally feel a sense of hate <laughs> towards the people that are telling us all those mendacious lies. I actually, I know I should love them, but I hate those protesters who stop me from going to work. Can I help myself? I really hate all those so-called experts who politicize health and arrogantly tell me what kind of food I can and I cannot eat, who basically tell me uh, whether or not I can smoke a cigarette, and basically imagine that they can treat me, an adult, as if I was a four-year-old child that needs their instruction. I also hate those people who sneer at the word populist. Every time they mention the word populist, you watch their face, that grimace, that kind of smugness that they communicate. And I have to say, I hate them as well. <laughs> but most of all, the people I really hate are the ones that tell me that it is wrong to hate, <laughs> right? That somehow, that somehow this very natural emotion that I'm sure virtually everybody in this room must have felt at least once in their lifetime is somehow out of bound and can be criminalized. And I think the reason why I've drawn the conclusion that we need to basically put in a good word for hate, because unless we're prepared to hate all these uh, targets that I mentioned, it's very difficult to manifest our love for each other, our love for humanity. It's very difficult to genuinely feel that kind of affection of solidarity if we are prevented from even exhibiting our emotion. You know, this panel talked about free speech, but there's something even more fundamental than that, which is our conscience. It is our, our freedom to live in accordance with our emotions. These emotions are one of the most foundational elements of our humanity. And if we deny them and play the role that's assigned to them, assigned to us, we end up behaving like children. I also think that it's time that we reappropriate another word and not feel any shame in using it. And that's the word populist. A couple of days ago, I was at a conference, and the conference consisted mainly of fairly good people who are on balance, sympathetic to many of the things that have been said here. But one thing that I noticed, because as they were talking about, about populism, they were very embarrassed. They kind of felt that they had to make it very, very clear that all right, these populists exist, but we're not like them. We're gentlemen, we're ladies. We're not like these other people who are, in a sense, uh, uh, should not be taken seriously. And I felt at that point that maybe it is also important to put in a good word for populism. And I've decided to use tonight to come out <laughs> and identify as a populist. <laughs> so, so I identify as a populist. Now, I want to say one thing, which is that compared to the last time I, I spoke here, a couple of years ago, I feel much more optimistic about the world, which, which sounds counterintuitive. I feel pretty good about the world because I've experienced a lot of positive energy, not just here, and this is remarkable, Alan, what's going on here, but also in the, in the real world. So for example, earlier this year, I was involved in organizing a network of, of farmers in Europe who were protesting against the attempt to destroy their way of life. You know, in Europe, there's a systematic attempt to use what they call the Green Deal, environmental laws, 
as a way of marginalizing small farmers and ensuring that their land is going to be taken over by big business or by some of those agribusinesses. And what was really remarkable is that these farmers, and they were from Holland, Belgium, Spain, Germany, France, all over Europe, these farmers had never done anything in their life that's remotely political. They never organized themselves. You know, they included the, the women and the men who were managing the farm. And suddenly, all these people who have never organized anything that's political, never imagined themselves as making an impact on public life, organized these massive demonstrations. They paralyzed Brussels. They let off sting bombs. You know, fortunately, in front of the Commission, the European Union Commission, there was cow dung in large piles, which I thought was a, a remarkably astute gesture, given what the EU Commission is like. And because of their activity, because people could see that they were gaining momentum, uh, a lot of concessions were made to them. Not enough, but a lot of concessions were made to them. I mean, you talk to the same farmers who last year basically did very little uh, that remotely to do with solidarity. The same people today uh, remarkably see themselves as political activists, as individuals who aren't simply the objects of history, but their subjects. And to me, that kind of experience where suddenly, almost overnight, ordinary people end up doing remarkable things tells us that it doesn't take very much to begin to gain momentum, to begin to realize that change is possible. And the more we look around us throughout Europe, we find that a growing number of people, especially young people, who in the past used to support the woke movements, are suddenly moving in a very different direction. And it's really great to see. I, I've been to uh, parties and, uh, and these discos that they organized, or raves as they call them, and you see all these kids politically enjoying each other, uh, being with each other, and at the same time giving two fingers to the powers that be. And I think this is really an important development, especially because, as you know, the stakes are high. In Brussels, where I often work, people often ask me, is it really true what's happening in Britain? Is it really true that people are being censored in that kind of systematic way? Is it really true that our system of justice often has adopted, embraced this vengeful act of revenge against people that they don't like? They want to know, is it really true that the, uh, that the powers that be, that are political elites, are fairly systematically trampling on our rights and on our freedom? And when I tell them that actually it is true, and it's surprising because Britain has had a reputation for fighting for freedom throughout the centuries, but is now somehow run by people who think freedom is a dirty word, freedom is a far right word. When I tell them that, then that's something that they actually feel as a problem for themselves. So I think that we have to realize that the stakes are very, very high at the moment. And we live in a world where literally everything that our government does attempts to render us helpless children. They continually talk about our safety. They continually talk about public health. They continually tell us how to behave. And it's almost as if they, they know their behavior is simply about infantilizing us, making us feel and act like children. So I think under those circumstances, it seems to me that we need a bit of courage. Now, I know that courage is one of those words that we use from time to time, and it you know, often doesn't mean very much. But it seems to me that courage is foundationally important, because as uh, Winston Churchill reminded us uh, some time ago, he, he said ch ch courage is the first of human qualities, because it is the quality which guarantees all the others. So courage is the first of human qual qualities. Because if you haven't got courage, then we're not in a position to gain freedom or preserve freedom. We're not in a position to look after our communities, to look after our loved ones, to defend ourselves. And it, it seems to me that especially today we need courage 
because as the previous panel suggested, the kind of conflicts that we're confronted with are civilizational. They really are civilizational because we have a, a situation today where, as the survey showed a couple of weeks ago, the majority of young people living in this society are not even proud of being British. They regard Britain's history and past as a story of shame. They actually believe that where they've come from, where they originated from, is something that is toxic and it's contaminated by negative qualities. And if our young people feel this way, if they basically have been dispossessed of the cultural inheritance that they need to make their way in this world, we are in very, very big trouble. So basically, I would uh, sort of end by saying that we need to examine in our own hearts what courage means. And I can think of no better way of explaining what that means to me and to uh, many of us who have, in a sense, tried to be a little bit braver than we would naturally be, is almost think of the word in initiative, taking the initiative, not just reacting to the latest outrage, not just responding when you want to kick the radio listening to the Today program, but take the initiative. And one of the good things about this meeting and together and, and the work that Alan has been doing is that uh, it isn't just simply reacting to what has happened. It's taking the initiative. And it's when we take the initiative, when we try something out, when we basically say, this is what needs to be done, these are the issues that we want reactions to, responses to. But we don't just simply wait until we get canceled or censored, but insist that our freedom is something that needs to be preserved in, and, and institutionalized. When we adopt that kind of attitude uh, as individuals, then courage no longer becomes just another word. It's something that we have internalized. And that is something that all of us are capable of doing. You know, courage is a small step that we take. So when you have to sign a document and you have to tick the boxes and the box asks you for your pronouns, you don't have to go along with that. You don't have to basically tick that particular box. You can move on. And I know that sometimes that takes a bit of courage because you're worried about HR, but just imagine if thousands of people refused to tick those boxes, if thousands of people basically said that the emperor has got no clothes. Because once, once people realize and say that the emperor has no clothes, then suddenly we realize that those individuals who appear so formidable and strong are actually empty, naked individuals. So go out and fight. We need everybody here to go out and fight and make sure that when we meet in the future, we would have had some really, really positive, uh, exciting results under our belt. Thank you.